Yeah, I'll talk about so two classical questions about uh, average case complexity theory. The um, couple of classical results that are known about them, and the uh, sort of open questions that are very challenging. Although sort of the field seems to be ripe for a new major breakthrough, so it might be a kind of good time to go again through the classics. Okay, so in uh, average case complexity theory, we are interested in the complexity of computational problems where instances come randomly from some uh, distribution. So here the definition of uh, a problem will be a computational problem and a distribution from which the inputs are coming. So for example, SAT could be easy when, on average, when we try to solve it uh, on inputs coming from a certain type of distribution, but that might be hard on average if we try to solve it coming from some uh, different distributions. So here, the object of interest will always be a pair. What's the problem and where are the inputs uh, coming from? Okay. So that's one example of uh, a computational problem with the distribution for which the um, average case complexity is um, open and come in an interesting way. Okay. So when we look at distributional problems, so a distributional problem is a computational problem together with a description of a distribution from which the inputs are coming from. Uh, so the positive results will be uh, algorithms that work well on average. There is more than one plausible definition of what this would mean, but uh, sort of will be interested in any kind of algorithm that satisfy any possible definition. <coughs> And the negative result, the ones that sort of come within the scope of uh, complexity theory, are to show that some distribution problems are um, intractable. And presumably this will be under uh, complexity assumptions because AFP equals NP, almost an interesting problem will be easy on, in the worst case, so for a stronger reason on average. And in, um, so from the point of view of complexity theory, it's certainly especially interesting if you're able to show anything under standard assumptions about important problems under distributions that model the kind of inputs that actually arise in practice. Because then um, that's the kind of result that can guide uh, algorithm design because it will show that a problem as formulated and distributions as coming from a certain probabilistic model are intractable. So if we want to get an efficient algorithm, we'll have to either uh, consider a relaxation of the problem or a different kind of distribution of inputs. But it's also interesting when one is able to show intractab intractability results on average, even for artificial problems and even for artificial distributions, because those problems could be the basis for uh, cryptographic applications, where um, sort of the the goal is to uh, come up with systems where uh, breaking the security guarantee is intractable and to do so by a reduction that shows that if you could break the crypto system then you could solve some other problem. And if you have some, uh, uh, as a primitive, a problem that is hard on average, doesn't matter if it's artificial, uh, it can be used as a primitive to construct some uh, secure system. Right. So the uh, sort of really ideal result uh, is when um, it's, uh, is when it's possible to sort of collapse the average case complexity and the worst case complexity of problems. So what would be really great to do for say for SAT under interesting distributions would be to say well either P equals NP and then uh, even in the worst case SAT is easy or P is different from NP and then not only by definition SAT is hard to solve in the worst case, but here is also a distribution on which it's uh, hard on average. Um, and so let me uh, start kind of on a positive note with the one important problem uh, for which this kind of uh, strongest possible understanding has been uh, achieved. It was a result of uh, Lipton from about 20 years ago. So this is the problem of computing the permanent uh, of a matrix. And for a square matrix, the permanent is uh, like the, the, de the determinant, but without the minus signs. So uh, given n by n matrix, the permanent would be the summation over all uh, permutations of uh, rows of the product of the elements of the diagonal after you do that permutation. The de determinant is the same, but you add or subtract depending on the sign of the permutation. Okay. For example, if you have a bipartite graph, 
and you take the 0, 1 uh, adjacent symmetric of the graph, the permanent will count the number of perfect matchings uh, of the graph. So that's one main motivation of this um, kind of matrix invariant. Uh, so what uh, Lipton was able to show was that if you have an algorithm for the permanent that performs well on average, then you can modify that algorithm so that it works on uh, every matrix. Uh, so, uh, so the permanent is uh, easy to solve under for an input random matrix, if and only if it's easy to solve for arbitrary matrices. Okay. Or sort of uh, contrapositively, if you believe that there are no worst case polynomial time algorithms for the permanent, there are also no polynomial time algorithms for the permanent that work well on average. Okay. So here was uh, uh, Lipton's um, idea. So here, as described, works when the calculations are done over a finite field, which is sufficiently large. Okay. So what we want to show is that, so suppose we have an algorithm that is good on average, we want to show that we can get for free a comparatively fast algorithm that works well uh, in the worst case. So what uh, we'll define as being good on average is to say that for uh, some reasonably large, except for a small fraction of uh, matrices, the algorithm finds the correct answer in polynomial time. Okay. So if the algorithm runs in average polynomial time, uh, it, what it means is that it will always find the correct value of the permanent, and then just by Markov inequality, on most inputs it will run uh, pretty fast. But um, the reduction will work even if the algorithm makes uh, mistakes on some inputs, or even if it fails to uh, terminate on some inputs. It's just sufficient that it terminates with the correct answer on a large fraction of inputs. You don't even need to know which input is which. That's the only assumption. Okay. So the, um, the, the, the approach is very simple. So say we are given a matrix M in input. That's the one for which you want to compute the permanent. Then the algorithm will pick at random a uniformly random matrix X. And then it will consider all the matrices of the form uh, M plus X, M plus 2X, M plus 3X, M plus 4X, and so on. Okay. So X is a random matrix. So 2 times X, 3 times X, 4 times X are random matrices and also m plus x is a random matrix, and m plus 2, they, they are correlated, but each by itself is a random matrix. Okay. So if you run this algorithm on the matrices m plus x, m plus 2x, m plus 3x, and so on, since each matrix by itself is a random matrix, you have a pretty good probability that the algorithm will find the correct value of the permanent in polynomial time. And by a union bound, this will happen with good probability for uh, all the matrices uh, simultaneously. Okay. Now, um, so now we have the value of the permanent for the matrix m plus x, m plus 2x, m plus 3x, and so on. The next observation is that the, per the formula for the permanent, if we think of it as sort of just a formal uh, expression uh, that takes n square inputs, the value of the n by n matrix, and gives an output, that formula is a degree n polynomial. Now, for fixed matrices m and x, the value of the permanent of uh, m plus uh, t times x, if t is some value, that becomes a polynomial in t. And the expression m plus tx is a matrix where every entry is a linear function of t. So an expression which is a polynomial in m plus tx is also a polynomial in t when m and x are fixed. And it will be a polynomial of degree n. So, uh, so call this polynomial little p. p of t is the permanent of the matrix m plus tx for every possible value of t. So here is a polynomial that has degree n. We know n plus 1 values of this polynomial. So we can just interpolate and we will find out what are the coefficients of this polynomial. Now that we know the coefficients, we can evaluate the polynomial at any other point of our choice. So then we evaluate p of 0. And what has What's p of 0? It's m plus 0 times x, so it's just uh, the permanent of uh, m. Uh, so this algorithm will give us the permanent of m whenever the other algorithm successfully computes the permanent of each of uh, m plus x, m plus 2x, m plus uh, nx, uh, which will happen with high probability. But high probability over the choice of x, over the internal randomness of the algorithm, that's an algorithm that works for every input uh, with high probability. So it's a BPP algorithm. Okay. 
So the outcome of this reduction is that if you have some uh, algorithm, even probabilistic, that works well on uh, most matrices, you can get an algorithm that works well on uh, all matrices. Okay. So worst case and average case complexity of the permanent are the same. Okay. So this sounds like kind of the um, template from which a lot of other uh, similar results could be uh, derived by working for uh, other problems. And in fact, there have been various extensions and generalizations. For example, it's known that uh, not only if you have an algorithm that runs in polynomial time for the permanent on uh, um, all but a 1 over n fraction of inputs, you can get the permanent, even if it works on 90% uh, of the inputs. But it was also a little work by um, Fag and Killian. They show that even if you have 1% uh, or so a small fraction of the inputs, you can still uh, reconstruct the permanent. And sort of a similar approach uh, works also for any problem which is complete for p space or for exponential time. Problems like uh, SAT, where you are allowed arbitrary quantifiers. Uh, you can prove the same type of uh, worst case and average case equivalents. Okay. Um, right, so what about SAT? Um, can, uh, could we do the same for SAT or tree coloring or other problems that are NP complete? To argue that um, if you could solve, say, tree coloring under some uh, natural distribution of graphs, then you could get an algorithm that solves uh, tree coloring and SAT, any NP complete problem in the worst case. So that's an open question. And um, so, I, I, as I will discuss uh, next, um, so if you think of uh, how one could hope to uh, establish uh, such a theorem for SAT, um, it cannot possibly work. Uh, so probably this kind of equivalence is true, but it's true for reasons that may be beyond uh, our current techniques. Yeah, what about for higher up in the polynomial hierarchy? Uh, it's open also anywhere in the and polynomial also hierarchy. The same natural approach will also not work in those cases, or? Um, Yes, the same. Um, yes, the same bottleneck uh, applies anywhere in the polynomial hierarchy. Yeah. Okay, so there is something that um, so is in the right direction, uh, which is the um, work started by Aitai on uh, worst case and average case equivalence of uh, lattice problems. So those are problems in uh, NP, and uh, so the. The general pattern of those results is to say, so here is a combinatorial optimization problem, um, NP type combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, suppose, and uh, so a related decision problem. So, so, and um, so uniform or so natural definition of in distribution of inputs. So it's able to show is that suppose we had a good on average algorithm for uh, this lattice problem under the uniform distribution, then this could be adapted to get an approximation algorithm that works in the worst case for the optimization problem. And um, such algorithms are not known to exist, actually conjecture not to exist. But um, so the worst case problem that you uh, get the equivalence to is not known to be NP-hard. In fact, pretty much cannot be NP-hard because it's in NP intersect NP. So it uh, seems to be kind of one level below the complexity of uh, NP-hard problems. Uh, so could there be a, kind of a variant of uh, results in this sort of family of uh, reductions? that is actually able to establish the hardness of al on average of some lattice problems, maybe even of some uh, lattice-related uh, cryptographic hash functions or one-way function. Uh, could it be shown to be equivalent to solving, in the worst case, some NP-hard lattice problem? So then we would be able to say, so here is a cryptographic hash function that's secure, provided that P is different from NP. So the most we can hope for. Okay. So here is the kind of uh, um, bottleneck that uh, seems to come up. Um, well, maybe I'll uh, come back to this after so first showing it uh, as a picture. So what, um, what would we like to argue? So say that L is some uh, lattice problem, or actually any problem, 
uh, that under some distribution we would like to argue that is hard on average, unless p equals np. So what we need is a reduction that will take an hypothetical good on average algorithm for this problem, and then we'll show if you have a good on average algorithm for this problem, then we can solve np hard problems everywhere. Okay. So that such an average case algorithm cannot exist unless p equals np. Okay. So what, then what does a reduction uh, look like? So this should be a reduction that takes in input a, an arbitrary input of an np complete problem, for example a formula f from 3 sat, uh, and then solves this arbitrary uh, sat instance. Uh, so it solves it by constructing a series of uh, random inputs for the lattice problem, or for sort of whatever problem we want to argue the hardness of. So that after getting um, the, the answers to those randomly generated uh, instances, each one random, correlated, but each one random, then it's able to say whether the given input was a yes instance of SAT or not. So that's the same pattern of Lipton's reduction. It's just that instead of uh, SAT, you had the permanent. Instead of L, you also had the permanent. So you produce random instances, you would answer to those random instances, and then you were able to solve an arbitrary input. And then, uh, since you are constructing random instances in the middle of this reduction, even if you have an algorithm that is good on average, that will be good enough. Okay. So such a reduction is kind of whatever you need together with an average case algorithm to establish that p equals np. So it's the reduction that will tell you that that problem L is hard on average. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not that there has to be such reduction for the average case hardness of the language to be there, but that's what we would mean to be kind of NP hard on average, that there exists a reduction that does this. Um, so, um, um, so this is a, a just writing down what are the conditions this reduction should satisfy in order to show that some problem L, for example, lattice problem, is as hard to solve on average as some other problem W for worst case is uh, hard to solve in the worst case. If you had a reduction like this for some problem W which is in NP uh, and is NP complete, like SAT, then we would have so the most that we can hope for. But um, Fagenbaum and Fortnow proved that whenever we have such reduction, the worst case problem that so we use as a, a so complexity starting point will be in NP intersect co NP. So it cannot be NP hard. Uh, so what's going on in Ida's result and later results is sort of unavoidable. That when you reduce an average case problem to a worst case problem, the worst case problem will be in NP intersect co NP. Okay. So not exactly. What they show is that it's uh, the complement as a two-round interactive proof, but it's sort of in the same ballpark of being in uh, co NP. Yeah. Yes? Does this work for when you have many distributions, not just one, like family of distributions, or when you have many? Um, right, so, um, um, well, not the result of Fagin and Fortno, but I think uh, the work I did with Andre uh, Bogdanov. If you want to argue something like there is a family of distributions, you want to prove at least one of them is hard. <coughs> so that's the same as trying to prove that the distribution in which first you pick one element from the family and then you sample according to that is hard. Uh, so that would still be sampleable, so I think it would still fit into our approach. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'll give a, a quick search of uh, how the proof uh, looks like, sort of where this coin P thing is coming from. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, again, what's, um, what's happening? So we, um, um, we have some setting in which we have been able to find a worst case to average case reduction. There is some problem W, uh, there is our worst case, our problem, some problem L, which is our average case, hard problem. 
and we have a reduction, the given a worst case input for W will solve it, provided that you can solve that is given access to solutions to random instances of L. Okay, okay so suppose we also know that those random instances of L are equally likely to be yes instances or no instances. Uh, that doesn't matter, but uh, simplifies. Okay. Uh, so then what we want to show is that uh, there is a two-round uh, uh, proof system uh, that allows us to prove uh, that certain inputs are uh, not in W. So think of W as being SAT. We get a two-round proof system to prove that some formulas are not satisfiable. Okay. So if, if SAT was in coin P, we would get a one-round proof system to prove that certain formulas are not satisfiable. Someone would just give us a certificate of unsatisfiability. Uh, but so if two round, from point, so it's the same kind of unlikely consequences. So it's about the same. Uh, okay. So the basic idea, uh, it's not exactly how it works, but so the basic idea is to say, Okay, um, so the, the party uh, on the left is the verifier. It's the one that has some input from W and wants to be, um, so wants to see some evidence that that input is not in W, like it's an unsatisfiable formula. So what it will do is to run internally an instance of the reduction. So it will create those random inputs to L, and then we'll give them to the prover. The prover is the party that wants to convince the verifier that the instance is not satisfiable. Then the prover is supposed to say for uh, each of those uh, inputs, so think of these as being like instances of lattice problems, say which one is a yes input and which one is a no input, for those that are yes inputs to provide the certificate. So if the prover responds uh, correctly, we are just repeating what the reduction is doing. So the verifier will be, um, so will come up to the right conclusion. Uh, but the point is that the verifier is not trusting what the prover is doing, but it will do this sort of sanity check to see um, whether the prover is claiming kind of the correct fraction of uh, yes and no answers in this reply. Okay. So we know that if you are producing m random uh, instances of, uh, say, the lattice problem, on average, m over 2 will be yes and m over 2 will be no. And maybe kind of close to uh, the average. Now, the prover has to certify the yes uh, instances. So it can only cheat by claiming that some yes instances were no instances. But it can pass this energy check also only by kind of cheating root n fraction of times. So this observation comes up, um, so it's useful, because if we just do what I just described, multiple times in parallel, so sort of by running multiple copies of this reduction, then asking the prover, you know, which of those inputs are yes and which of those inputs are no, well then, by just doing sufficiently many repetitions in parallel, we'll independently, we'll have pretty good concentration around the fact that half the answers are yes and half the answers are no, which gives the prover a pretty small ability of cheating while still staying in this small range. So, mm, okay, so there is a so couple of minutes of calculations. The, uh, uh, in many or some of those uh, uh, simulated uh, runs of the reduction, the prover will provide all correct answers, and then we'll sort of see that this is what's going on. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of the moral is that um, if we have this kind of uh, reduction that works on uh, average, um, you're sort of going from NP to coin P. The fact that the reduction works on average is sort of telling you on many iterations roughly how many yes and no inputs you would expect, and that's a lot of information, something that wouldn't happen in a typical worst case reduction. Okay. So that's a, these are some further generalizations, but there actually remains um, a question open, which is if uh, this reduction that transforms uh, a good on average algorithm into a worst case algorithm uses the average case algorithm in stages with each stage depending on the answer to previous questions. Instead of just producing a bunch of inputs, evaluating those inputs, and then kind of combining the answers. 
Uh, well, then we are not sure. I mean, there is no result that, sh that says what's going on in that case. Uh, in the case, we don't know whether the worst case problem using the reduction must be in Cohen P or not. Yeah, so that's the uh, statement of uh, the question that uh, sort of remains open. Uh, the Fagema Fortino paper came out in the know, early 90s, so it has been open since. Okay. So there is a um, so there is one more result about this sort of worst case versus um, average case. Um, this sort of shows how even little differences in so stating what we want can uh, can be important. Okay. Uh, so this is what uh, we don't know how to prove and what is sort of pretty much impossible by the kind of reduction that I described to show that when uh, a NP is hard in the worst case, there is some distribution such that NP is hard on average under the distribution. So uh, what it means is that, I mean, what is the statement that we don't know how to uh, prove? Is that when uh, uh, NP is hard in the worst case, uh, there is some hard distribution for some NP-complete problem, uh, such that for every algorithm that you can come up with, there will be a large fraction of inputs on which the, that algorithm doesn't work, like either runs in super polynomial time or makes a mistake. Okay. Uh, but um, good French LTL and Tashma were able to prove almost the same thing. They just kind of said difference in the uh, order of quantifiers. So they were able to show that if NP is hard in the worst case, um, well, there's some uh, fixed language. You could even do it for SAT. Such that for every algorithm, there is a distribution uh, that is efficiently sampleable, such that that algorithm makes uh, a lot of mistakes under that distribution. Okay. So it's saying that so if P is different from NP, also for randomized algorithms, then uh, for every algorithm that you try to come up with to solve SAT, well, it will make mistakes uh, because it's impossible to have a polynomial time algorithm for SAT. But in fact, there is also an efficient procedure that will find those mistakes and uh, lots of them. Okay. Um, unfortunately, so the dead switch of quantifiers, it's a very uh, fundamental one. So this is uh, inherently different from uh, establishing a worst case to average case reduction. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a known trivial result in this direction. Okay. Right, so this was the so first um, classical question I wanted to uh, talk about. Is there a um, possibility of basing the existence of average case hard problems on the existence of worst case uh, hard problems? Okay. Uh, as sort of here, um, so the main answer is we don't know and kind of the main what I find to be the most interesting result is the Fagerman for no impossibility result that says that for what would be the most natural approach, uh, there is a bottleneck. Um, so if uh, there is this kind of uh, uh, gap or so, um, separation between complexity of worst case and complexity of uh, average case, <laughs> so the other interesting question would be to say, well, if I look at different uh, problems on average, can I compare their complexity? So maybe I can say, you know, solving SAT under a certain distribution is not the same as solving SAT everywhere, but maybe it's equivalent to solving tree coloring under some other distribution, or it's equivalent to solving sparse SCAT under some other distribution. So at least we have some connection between uh, uh, mm, so more apple-to-apple -apple comparison between uh, problems of this type. Okay. So the um, so a starting point to formulate this question would be to find a sort of uh, NP-complete on average problem. Like to find some problem such that uh, if you can uh, um, solve it under some uh, distribution, well on average, then you could solve well on average every other problem in NP under every distribution. Okay. So it cannot actually be um, Uh, it's actually even too much just to uh, ask for this, to say, 
So here is some problem and some distribution. If you can solve this problem under this distribution, then you can solve every other problem in P under every distribution. Because sort of when you allow, when you're looking at every problem in NP, do well on average under every distribution, that's equivalent to P equals NP. Because sort of when you allow arbitrary distributions, that's the same as sort of requiring worst case complexity. In fact, there is a, well, there are various ways of proving it, but kind of pretty interesting way of uh, proving it is to show that um, if you define a certain distribution over inputs, where the probability of picking an input is proportion is dependent on its uh, Kolmogorov complexity. So the sort of uh, less random-like uh, elements are more likely to be generated, and kind of Kolmogorov random elements are less likely to be generated. Well, um, for every problem in NP, actually for any problem is decidable, the average case complexity of the problem under this distribution is the same as the worst case complexity. So if you have an algorithm that works well on average under this distribution, it will actually work on every input except finitely many. So, um, so now, to get started on a theory of average case complexity for NP that is really different from the worst case complexity, you must rule out um, distri special distributions like this. And sort of the most natural restriction is to just look at sampleable distributions, uh, distributions that are obtainable or approximable by the output of a probabilistic uh, procedure. That's because somehow the inputs on which we want to solve problems, they are coming from uh, somewhere. They saw some application domain that generated those inputs. So somehow there was a feasible probabilistic process from which the inputs that you're interested in are coming. So restricting ourselves to sampleable distributions of inputs should still allow kind of any distribution of inputs that would arise in practice. Okay. And so Levin, mm, so, so two papers, one by Levin and one by Pagliazzo and Levin, they show that um, some of there is some kind of uh, complete average case problem in NP. So there is a particular problem, but from that point on they could show many others such that if the problem is hard on average, um, I mean, if the problem were easy on average, then every problem in NP for any sampleable distribution would also be easy on average. Okay. So that's sort of the hardest problem in NP under any sampleable distribution. Um, so what, what I want to conclude with is a um, sketch of uh, what this argument looks like and so what, what it implies and what is still missing to be a sort of the average case version. So why don't we have an average case version of Gary and Johnson, and so why we don't teach average case complexity theory to undergrads? Well, some people don't. <laughs> some people don't. <laughs> um, OK, so what's, um, so this is what we would like to argue, that there is some prominent P um, <coughs> such that um, mm, Provided that anywhere in NP for any kind of sampleable distribution, something is hard on average, this particular problem has to be hard on average. Okay. So this is actually uh, Levin's paper as it appeared in uh, Stock 85. It was <laughs> famously a one-page paper with no references. And uh, maybe you cannot read the paper from there, but that's the least of your concerns. <laughs> <laughs> But there is a story that is probably false, but so it's good enough that it doesn't matter if it's true or not. That um, when Levin submitted uh, the full version to Simon Journal of Computing, um, which was the same length, uh, the, um, the editor's response was, yeah, it's great, it's really interesting, we want it to appear in uh, SciComp, but it will have to be at least uh, four times longer. And then Levin sent back uh, the same paper, four copies of it stapled uh, <laughs> together. <laughs> After which so the editor says, yeah, whatever. And uh, in SciComp it's a page and a half, but just because SciComp is like this one. And it has three references or something. Uh, right. So what does the paper um, talk about? So one of the uh, interesting contributions of the paper is to come up with a good definition of uh, reduction between uh, distributional problems. 
between problems that come with a distribution of uh, inputs. Right. And um, so he, he also discusses a particular definition of what it means for an algorithm to perform well on average, which is sort of a surprisingly tricky issue. And there, there's sort of more than one uh, good definition of what it means for an algorithm to perform well on average. Um, thankfully, Levin's definition of reduction works with any of those definitions, so, so it doesn't matter which definition you prefer. Um, Okay, so uh, how do you define reductions? So say we have two problems, A and B, each one coming with some distribution of inputs, a distribution of A and a distribution of B. And maybe we have SAT with some distribution over formulas and tree coloring with some distributions over graphs. Okay. So a, distrib a, a reduction of one problem to the other will be, in Levin's definition, something that would have been a reduction in the standard sense. So it's something that takes an input of A and gives back an input for B with the property that a yes input for A becomes a yes input for B, a no input for A becomes a no input for B. So that if you can correctly figure out what's the B solution of uh, R of X, you get what's the A solution for X. Okay. Uh, but that's not good enough. Uh, the other property also has to be that well, intuitively, what you would like to say is that I have an algorithm that will solve problem B, typically, provided that you are feeding this algorithm inputs that are coming from the distribution of B. Okay. So, to have some guarantee that things will work out, what you would like to say is that if I sample an input from the distribution of A and then apply the reduction, what I get is an input for B distributed according to the distribution of B. So if that's your definition of uh, reduction, that preserves average case tractability, and so works very well, but it's a very, it's almost, a, I mean, it's not a very usable definition, because it's almost impossible to guarantee this property that if you start from a random input from one distribution and then you apply the reduction, you get exactly a random input of the other distribution. Uh, so uh, one could work with some kind of approximation, say that what you get is statistically close to random input of the other distribution. But in fact, a much weaker property, which makes a definition much more usable, is sufficient. That basically all you want is that um, if you have any um, subset of inputs for B, which have a low probability under the distribution of B, you want to say that if you pick a random element from A and apply the reduction, you are going to have a low probability of hitting that set. Okay. So what you want from this distribution that you get by sampling from A and then applying the reduction is that maybe it's even a completely different distribution from the distribution of B, but it just satisfies this property that low probability events stay low probability events. Maybe they get multiplied by some constant, maybe even a polynomial in N, but you don't get, say, exponentially small probability events becoming inverse polynomial probability events. They should sort of uh, maintain more or less the same probability. So that's the condition that that so formula is uh, enforcing. And now that works well because um, so each of the um, so incomparable and meaningful definitions of average case tractability, they all come down to defining uh, some notion of uh, bad input and then requiring bad inputs to have some negligible probability of occurring. And this definition of reduction tells us that if you get a random input for A, apply the reduction and then apply algorithm B, now the inputs for A that are going to be bad for the algorithms, for the algorithm are those that get mapped into bad inputs for algorithm B. A B had few bad inputs according to its own distribution, but it's also going to have few bad inputs according to the output of the reduction. So even the algorithm for A is going to be safe. It's going to be unlikely to hit uh, those uh, bad inputs. Okay. So then it's also easy to show that those reductions uh, compose uh, because of this property, uh, you know, just lose some extra factor when you compose it. 
Um, okay. All right, so that's the definition of uh, reduction. So um, what I want to show you is so Levin's uh, argument, as uh, explained by Odette Goldreich, of uh, why there exists some problem that is complete for all of uh, NP. Okay. So the problem will be um, uh, just kind of artificial. Just say, given an undermissive Turing machine and an input, does the machine accept the input? Okay. So that's sort of a generic NP complete problem. Um, so we want to show that if we can solve this problem well uh, on average, uh, we can solve any other problem in NP well on average. Or so that there is a reduction from any problem to this problem. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's pick some arbitrary problem. We could think of SAT for concreteness. Okay. So we want to reduce um, say SAT to this generic Turing machine problem. Okay. So how would we uh, go about that? We could say, uh, given an input for SAT, we write down an input for this Turing machine problem, where we have the Turing machine that decides, the non-deterministic Turing machine that decides SAT, then we copy the formula, and we say, well, does this machine accept this formula? So it's a very straightforward uh, reduction. Uh, in fact, that's how we will prove the NP-completeness of the problem in the standard sense. But it doesn't quite work uh, here, because if uh, our input is not uniformly distributed, what we generate is not a uniformly distributed instance of the Turing machine problem. There will be, a, well, first of all, the first piece will be fixed. That's not too bad because it's just a constant. But then there will be this other big piece that just comes from some arbitrary distribution. So here, uh, Levin's idea is to uh, compress the input uh, before constructing the reduction. Okay? So it will apply, say, say, say we start from SAT, an input of SAT coming from some distribution. So what we will do is to first uh, compress the instance of SAT, then write down a Turing machine that first decompresses uh, what it's getting, and then solve SAT in linear time non okay. Um Well, then, so the first, in, in this reduction, the, the first part, the machine that does decompressing and then solving SAT, they're just a constant number of bits. So even though they're fixed, they only affect probabilities by a constant. The constant will be 2 to the 100,000, uh, but <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. And, uh, so what happens to the uh, rest of the input? Uh, well, now we have a random instance coming from some distribution to which a compression algorithm has been applied. Now, if this compression algorithm is information theoretically optimal, um, the output will be pretty much a random bit string. Okay. Uh, so um, in Levin's paper, uh, he uses a certain class of distributions for which it's easy to get information theoretically optimal compression algorithms. And so that's his reduction. Uh, apply uh, the compression algorithm and then sort of just write down in the reduction the machine that decompresses and then solves that. Um, uh, this uses arithmetic coding uh, that is information theoretically optimal. Uh, the later paper by Impagliazzo and Levin works for every distribution, at least every kind of computer, every sampleable distribution. And that relies on the fact that um, sort of a random hash function with high probability is, a, is an optimal compression algorithm. So if I have to uh, sort of describe the work in three wrong sentences, that's uh, how we do it. Uh, that's the, um, I think that's uh, the, the basis of the argument. Um, so this shows that there exists some problem. Uh, so there exists an average case version of the Cook-Levin theorem. That there exists some problem such that if that particular problem is easy on average, every other problem under any sampleable distribution is also easy on average. Okay. But then what about 3 sat on n variables with 10 n clauses or uh, tree coloring in a random uh, Erdos-Schrödinger graph? 
so it's still a challenge to get um, sort of problems, distribution of problems that are kind of independently interesting to uh, fit into this framework. And there are, uh, although there are a number of uh, complete problems that are fairly natural and they're fairly reasonable uh, distributions. But um, somehow, um, my feeling is that the, um, the field here is so sort of stuck where hardness of approximation was before uh, the Papa Dimitriou Yanakaki's paper, which uh, maybe many people don't know about, but it sort of came a few years before the PCP paper. And um, it describes a lot of reductions between um, optimization problems that preserve the approximation. So they say things like, okay, we don't know if max cut is hard to approximate or it has a PTAS. And we don't know if uh, max 3 sat is hard to approximate or it has a PTAS. But max cut is a PTAS if and only if uh, uh, max 3 sat does, if and only if uh, metric TSP does. Yeah. So they had this wonderful sentence in the paper. They said, you know, once more, as usual in complexity theory, we have not uh, increased the number of answers, but we have decreased the number of questions. Because this also showed that the approximate of all those problems were uh, related. And then, um, some of the, the timing was great because when the PCP paper uh, came out and it showed that the max 3 sat was, did not have a PTAS, then automatically all those reductions were there and they established a whole bunch of uh, other hardness. Um, so here, we might be very far from the equivalent of the PCP theorem, something establishing worst case to average case complexity for promising NP, but maybe we're not too far from uh, the equivalent of the Papa Dimitri Yanakaki's paper, something really establishing a, an interesting network of reductions, maybe not even completeness in Levin's sense, but at least uh, uh, saying things like, uh, so here are two well-studied problems and they are equivalent. So here is a problem suggested by Russell in Pagliazzo. So very, so even these kind of very non-ambitious questions are completely open. Just look at uh, uh, two different distributions of random tree sat and show that they are equivalent. That if you have, so here, so in this case, for random tree sat, you have to be um, careful what definitions of uh, good on average algorithm you're using. Because here, an algorithm that on every input says unsatisfiable is correct with high probability. Uh, what you want is an algorithm that um, is allowed to run in super polynomial time, but must always give the right answer and must run in average polynomial time. Or maybe an algorithm that either gives the correct answer or fails and uh, it terminates in polynomial time always and fails uh, with reasonably small probability. But sort of for any, so there are a few of those. But for a, a definition of uh, good on average that makes sense for random tree sat, show that you can do it for some distribution if and only if you can do it for another. Uh, even this seems to be um, tricky. Um, okay, so a, a while ago, uh, Andrei Bogdanov and I wrote a survey on uh, average case uh, complexity. And I uh, also taught a course at Berkeley on uh, average case complexity. So those will be some uh, places to look at if you want to look at more open questions and then trace back uh, more references. Okay, I'll uh, stop here. Thanks. certificate of unsatisfiability that you can check in polynomial time uh, well, with a polynomial size circuit, which seems a really strong uh, confidence. And also, if uh, the complement of SAT 
and this kind of two round or constant round traffic proof. Then they will on a hierarchy will collapse to the third level. But so what I find the most uh, counterintuitive conclusion is the existence of these coronal size circuits that check certificates of unsatisfiability. Yeah. Do you have some problems in mind that you might fit might the average case are beyond the last problem? Uh, I mean, there are problems for which uh, there are open questions, like uh, take a, a random graph with probably half of each edge. There is a click of size 2 log n. Uh, can you do better than 1 times uh, log n? Uh, there, is, uh, there is finding, so certifying unsatisfiability of 3 sat uh, beyond the unsatisfiability threshold. Uh, and then I will sort of turn the uh, question around and say, for example, what are um, instances of uh, max cut uh, for which it's random average to do better than uh, 0.878? Although, uh, on the point of view of what we really believe to be hard, um, you have um, a sort of learning parity with error type of problem. So say you have a system of uh, XOR uh, equations with three variables per equation, where, um, let's say, um, let's say you start from a planted solution, say there are n variables <coughs> and uh, 100 times n um, equations. You start by picking a random and assignment to the variables, and then uh, well, first you pick uh, which triples occur in equations. Then you pick a random assignment to the equations. And then you fix the right hand side so that each of them will probably 99% is compatible with the assignment, to the 1% is good. So then 99% of the equations are simultaneously satisfied, but it seems hard to satisfy 51%. Uh, so this is a very um, Kind of good candidate of uh, problem, even with a gap, that should be hard knowledge. And at least if that's hard knowledge, then uh, just applying deductions, you get instances of max cap for which it's hard average to be better than 16 over 17. But we don't know uh, any candidate distribution for which you would not be able to do better than 0.87. Or any, we don't know any. Uh, distribution of unique games um, for which uh, there isn't an algorithm just uh, completely the, the, the divorce break. There's no, there's no challenging distribution of unique games that we know. Uh, 